Chapter Two of The Man Who Fought the Devil by Eva K. Betts. Chapter Two. Jean Marie was disappointed, very deeply so, when he learned that his parents had been to Mass without him. I could have gone, he insisted. I am almost a man, and I know all my prayers and catechism lessons. But no children were there, no children at all, his mother explained, not even the DeFore children, and the Mass was said in their father's barn. Well, I suppose I couldn't expect to go then, but I would have liked to, replied the boy with a sigh. In the days which followed, no one told Jean-Marie that soon after the Italian fighting, the whole French army was under Bonaparte's control. Prussia decided that she didn't care to continue the war any longer. Shortly after that, Spain followed her example. A little later, Austria, too, made peace with France. So France now remained at war only with England and Sardinia. The Vianney family lived much as they always had. Things cost more and there was less money to buy them. More beggars than ever came to be fed. More and more families whom they knew lost fathers or sons in Napoleon's army. But except for these things, the Vianneys were almost unaware of the mighty struggle for power which was going on in the world. The General Bonaparte, of whom the passing horseman had spoken to Jean-Marie, was becoming a person of growing importance, was becoming more outspoken about his ambitions. Do you suppose that I have gained my victories in Italy, just to further the ambitions of the people ruling France? he asked. Do you think that my object is to establish a republic? Nonsense. Napoleon Bonaparte was shrewd, and he was ruthless. He had the army largely with him because men liked to serve under a victorious leader, and Bonaparte had great skill as a military commander. While he climbed step by step into a position of power, he shrewdly changed some of the laws and regulations which were most irritating to the people of France. He did not believe, any more than the king had believed, that the people could rule themselves. But, when it did not interfere with his plan, he lessened some of the pressures which were making them unsettled. He did not return the church property that had been seized, nor did he at once change the laws which had sent most priests into hiding. But there was less open persecution of them. They were able to travel a little more openly although they still had no parish churches in which to say Mass. So it came about that in the early spring of 1799, the sisters of St. Charles arrived quietly in the little town of Eccoli to teach the children there. They could not have a parochial school, but they could at least live in a convent, and at regular intervals could gather the children into their home or the home of a neighbor to teach them something of their religion. Mr. and Mrs. Vianney talked over the situation. Jean Marie knows the answers in his catechism, Mrs. Vianney said. At least he knows all the answers we have. All we have? her husband asked. What do you mean? The baby got the book and chewed up some of the pages, was her reply. Mr. Vianney shook his head sadly. Not many, his wife added hastily, and she didn't swallow them. But they are of no use, and I forget what was on them. But even if we had them, I would not feel able to prepare Jean-Marie for his first communion. There was silence between them for a moment. Mr. Vianney watched the glowing embers in the kitchen fireplace as he thought the matter over. "'I suppose it will be best to send the boy to stay with his uncle at Eccoli, he said at last, "'though I will miss him. He is such a dependable boy, but his religion must come first. "'I was hoping you would say that,' Mrs. Vianney exclaimed. "'I will miss him, too. But it would be wrong not to take advantage of the chance to have him properly instructed, and he will learn to write and to figure, too.' Not people to waste time once the action had been decided upon, the parents told the plan to the children when they wakened them at daybreak the following day. "'Your father will drive into Eccoli this morning,' explained Mrs. Vianney, "'to discuss the matter with your uncle and with the sisters.' "'Then I will go in tomorrow?' Jean-Marie asked eagerly. "'That remains to be seen,' answered his mother. "'Today you and Frankels will take your pickaxes and loosen the earth in the far field where I plant the cabbages.' instructed Mr. Vianney. When the two older boys worked together, Jean-Marie was always disheartened, because he never could keep up with Frankel's. But he is bigger and stronger, his mother would explain. Not so much bigger, Jean-Marie would protest. If I tried a little harder, I think I could do as much. This particular morning he had a plan. The little statue of the Madonna had been given him some time before by a nun who was driven from Paris, when all the convents had been closed during the Reign of Terror. She had found shelter for a while at her brother's home on a little farm near Dardilly. 
Her one treasure, the little statue, she had given to Jean-Marie because of his great love for Our Lady. When Mr. Vianney left for Eccoli, Frankles and Jean-Marie took their pickaxes and went out to break up the heavy clods of earth. As always, Jean-Marie had his little statue with him. The two boys measured by the length of their tool handles the distance there should be between rows. Then they set to work swinging the pickaxes down into the hard earth, turning up the clods and breaking them into fine particles. Jean-Marie ran a few yards down the row he was working on, set his statue on the ground, and said, Dear lady, help me to keep up with Frankles this far. When he reached the statue, he and Frankles were even. He set the statue a little farther on, and again asked for help. When the sun set, the field was ready, and Jean-Marie had done a full half of the work. Jean-Marie kept up with me right through the day, Frankles reported. He seemed a little unsure whether to be proud of the younger boy or annoyed with him. Mrs. Vianney smiled. He had a good alley, she commented. Come, get yourselves washed, then look in the yard and the lane and see if there are any people waiting to be fed. With your father away, that is your charge, Frankles. Oh, I hope the nuns are willing to teach me and that my uncle takes me to stay with him, said Jean-Marie longingly. Whatever God decides is best for you is what will happen said his mother. Yes, I know that, but will uncle and the nuns understand what God says? His mother was spared an attempt to answer that question by the entrance of Frankel's leading three hungry men. The meal was hardly begun when they heard the sound of Mr. Vianney's wagon in the stable yard. He came into the house, greeted the family, and made the guests welcome, then sat down to eat. In spite of the fact that Jean-Marie had spent a hard day working in the fields, his appetite suddenly left him. Had his father come home with a yes or a no? Other problems suddenly arose in his mind. Suppose the answer was yes. How would it be living away from his parents and sister and brothers? Would his aunt let him mold the clay statues and candlesticks, the making of which was his favorite recreation? The idea of leaving home to live in a strange place suddenly became a little frightening. Then he began to think of the nuns. He was not quick to learn, he knew. Would they be as patient as his mother and his big brother were? He would try his best, but would it be enough? Or would he make his mother's sister and her husband, Mr. and Mrs. Humbert, ashamed of him? His mind was in a turmoil, and his stomach very uneasy. By the time the meal was over, the poor people bedded down in the haymow, and the family gathered around the fire. "'Well, Jean-Marie, I won't keep you in suspense any longer,' smiled his father. Your uncle and aunt are delighted at the thought of having a boy in the house again, and the sisters of St. Charles will gladly instruct you. Jean-Marie drew a deep breath. He looked around at the family gathered in the kitchen. Eccoli was the best part of a day's walk, so he would not see them often while he was at school. And, somehow, he had never loved them so much as he did just then. W when will I go? he asked in a rather small voice. The day after tomorrow. I must put a patch on your shoe tonight, and I'm sure your mother will find things to be done before you are ready. Indeed, yes. He can go barefoot tomorrow while I wash both of his pairs of stockings. And Frankles, let him wear your underclothes so I can launder both of his sets. Jean-Marie, she added, turning to the young would-be traveler, give me your suit when you go to bed, so I can darn any thin spots and make sure no buttons are loose. I will get up early and make you a package of food to carry, offered Marguerite. That won't be necessary, Mr. Vianney assured his daughter. We will be there before noon. Just think of it. Jean-Marie will sleep here tonight, and tomorrow night and the next night he will be in Eccoli. None of the Vianney children had ever been out of their village of Dardilly. As far as they were concerned, the neighboring town was at the end of the earth. They looked with great respect at the brother, who not only was going so far away, but was going to remain there for a while. Frankles. Run to the workshop and bring me a piece of leather, directed Mr. Vianney, a piece about so big. He measured the size he wanted between his thumb and forefinger. This shoe is cracked here, and will break right through if I don't stop it now. Frank was sped to the workshop at one end of the barn. Mrs. Vianney got her sewing basket, lighted a candle on the kitchen table, and settled down to her mending. Jean-Marie set to work waxing and polishing the shoe, which didn't need mending. The other children tried to find jobs to do in this important family project, but succeeded only in confusing things. So all the young people were sent to bed, while Mr. and Mrs. Vianney 
worked to prepare Jean Marie to go out into the world. The next morning but one, Jean Marie's clothes were folded neatly and packed into a small box. The boy's mind was in a less orderly state than his wardrobe. He was afraid to leave home, even though he would not be with strangers. Yet he was burningly anxious to go to school and to prepare for his first communion. One emotion and then the other took possession of him until he was completely confused. Before he could sort out his thoughts, he and his father had arrived at Ecoli. He was settled in his uncle's home, and his father had left. Then began the difficult days. Jean-Marie was a hard worker, a conscientious student who toiled ceaselessly to learn his assigned lessons. Learned them he did, but when he was called on to recite, his memory always failed him. He stammered and stuttered and lapsed into miserable silence. Despite this, the nun sensed the quality in the boy which made them willing to give him special attention. He moved along with his class, and at last the great day came. June in 1799 had been unusually fine so far, but one particular morning seemed to outdo all that had gone before it. From before daylight, wagons and carriages had been leaving the farms around Eccoli, and though the people in the various vehicles pretended not to recognize or even see one another, they all seemed to be heading for the same place the home of the neighborhood nobleman, Count de Pignon. Quietly they tied their horses in the stable yard, and as quietly went in through the wide doors of the great house set among the tall trees. A big room on the first floor had been arranged as a chapel. See, whispered Mrs. Vianney to her husband, the countess has decorated the altar with flowers. Her husband nodded and ushered his children before him. Soon everyone was settled and waiting breathlessly for mass to begin. At last the priest came into the room, and stood for a moment facing the congregation, but looking beyond them to the back of the chapel. They come! No one really said it, but at once all heads turned to look toward the door. Two by two, white veils on their heads and carrying lighted candles, the little girls of the first communion class walked down the aisle between chairs and up to the seats near the altar. Then came the boys, faces shining, clothes well brushed, and wearing white ribbons on their arms. Just as when we were children, whispered Mrs. Vianney, the veils, the ribbons, the candles. Not quite the same, pointed out her husband. Then it was a church. Now it is a parlor with curtains drawn. Their whispers stopped and mass began. When the services were over, the people arose to leave. It had been arranged that they wouldn't all leave at once. Such an outpouring would attract too much attention, rouse too much curiosity. May we stay until the last? Jean Marie whispered to his father. Even when the others were all well on the way to their homes, the boy still didn't want to go. He fingered the rosary which had been his first communion gift and gazed lovingly at the little altar. The next day, at home with his own people in Dardilly, he was called early. You are a man now, Jean Marie, said his father, so you will do the work along with Frankles and me. So Jean Marie, though small for his thirteen years, put on his work clothes, and started sharing the heavy labor, while one of the younger boys took on the duty of caring for the sheep. End of chapter 2 Recording by Maria Therese